As deep fakes start to become more of a problem, the White House is looking to potentially cryptographically verify all official communications. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown. AI deep fakes were on just about every Politico's watch list for a big 2024 issue. Given that we have the presidential elections here in the US and other elections around the world, it seemed like this was going to be a thing that we were going to deal with. Already, it started in some ways. Just before the New Hampshire primary, many of that state's Democrats got a phone call from someone that sounded like President Biden telling them not to go out and vote because their vote didn't matter until November. Whether it was that particular instance or something else, you knew that there was going to be a lot of discussion around how to deal with the issue of deepfakes, and now it appears the White House is having an explicit conversation around that. What makes this interesting is that if you ask the crypto community around where there is or if there is an intersection between the artificial intelligence world and the crypto world, one of the things they will often point to is the idea that you can use blockchains, which are effectively public truth machines, as a way to cryptographically verify what's real and what isn't. To put it simply for those who haven't spent a ton of time in that world, one way to think about, for example, the blockchain that underlies Bitcoin is just as a shared public ledger that is an agreed-upon assessment of who owns what within that system. The whole purpose of the Bitcoin ledger is for people to be able to agree that I own X Bitcoin while you own Y Bitcoin without there having to be an intermediary who says that it's so. The idea then of using some sort of similar approach, although not necessarily exactly the same, to certify when something is real has appealed to a lot of people. Well, now it isn't just crypto people who are talking like that, but in fact the White House itself. Business Insider published a piece at the end of last week titled The White House Wants to Cryptographically Verify Videos of Joe Biden So Viewers Don't Mistake Them for Deepfakes. This came after the FCC declared AI-generated robocalls illegal last week. But of course, the whole issue with this is that legality doesn't necessarily stop these deepfakes from having a big issue in practice. President Biden's special advisor for artificial intelligence, Ben Buchanan, said that one of the ways that they're trying to address this is to verify all official communications. From BI, Buchanan said the aim is to essentially cryptographically verify everything from the White House, whether a statement or a video. Buchanan pointed out that one of the provisions of the executive order last year had created an AI safety institute at the Department of Commerce that had at the core of its mission to create standards for watermarking content to show provenance. Now, this White House effort is apparently separate and more specifically focused on official White House communications. Buchanan said, this is a case where we recognize the potential for harm. We're trying to get ahead of it. So, of course, right now, this is just an open conversation, but it matters, I think, more than just whether we'll get clarity around whether something is actually President Joe Biden or not. It also matters because to the extent that the White House figures out an approach for this that works for them in this particular instance, I think that you could see that then be more broadly influential. In other words, others might want to take seriously this idea of cryptographically verifying information or videos or photos or any sort of information that can be faked by AI. And at the same time, it might also be a catalyst for helping consumers understand how to do this sort of verification on their end, how to demand actual proof before they accept something as real. Ultimately, it is going to be a weird melange of consumer expectation shifts, plus new technological approaches, plus, of course, the legal system that nudges us towards a place where we've adapted to the world of deepfakes, but the White House making it an issue certainly increases the speed with which that might happen. Now, the U.S. is, of course, not the only country dealing with these sort of issues. One other really interesting case study in how AI could impact politics is happening over in Pakistan right now. I'm John Massad, the CEO of Replit Tweets. Cyberpunk moment. Pakistan's ousted slash jailed former PM have been using AI to campaign for his party from behind bars and now uses AI to deliver his victory speech. The New York Times coverage of this piece was titled Imran Khan's victory speech from jail shows AI's peril and promise. So without having to go too deep into the political situation in Pakistan, the former PM Imran Khan has spent basically the entire electoral campaign in jail. Yet in spite of this, he's been using AI to replicate his voice, which was part of a strategy that was deployed by his party to, as the New York Times put it, circumvent a crackdown by the military. The Times goes on. On Saturday, as official counts showed candidates aligned with his party, PTI winning the most seats in a surprise result that threw the country's political system into chaos, it was Mr. Khan's AI voice that declared victory. For the Times, this is actually an example of how AI can be used to prevent political crackdowns. They write, As concerns grow about the use of artificial intelligence and its power to mislead, particularly in elections, Mr. Khan's videos offer an example of how AI can work to circumvent suppression. However, as they point out, it still has the net effect of, as Toby Walsh put it, undermining our belief in the things we see and hear. Now, to me, this isn't a particularly compelling line of argument about why a technology is bad. 
If our entire discourse about any new technology was, well, it can be used for good or bad, so therefore we should be worried about it, we would be worried constantly about every new technology. Technology is, of course, neutral. And that doesn't mean the good or the bad use cases are equivalent, and that is, of course, worth discussing. But not engaging with it, because sometimes it might be used for bad ends, doesn't undermine the good that can be done with it as well. What's more, an angle that I'm surprised I'm not seeing more from the mainstream media coverage of this, is the fact that, while the concern around deepfakes is that they undermine people's understanding of what's real and what's fake, in this case, we have an instance where everyone knows that artificial intelligence was used to make these speeches and these videos. Their purpose was not to deceive people into thinking that somehow Imran Khan had access to broadcasts from behind bars, but instead to galvanize a party in a public with a voice of a leader that otherwise would be silenced. I think one could make the argument that that sort of introduction to artificial intelligence will actually increase people's acumen about the technology. In other words, get a chance to understand its power without being deceived by it, but also getting familiar with what it sounds and feels like when receiving a message from it. Now, these issues are very live and ongoing. Another piece from the Washington Post today writes, AI companies agree to limit election deepfakes but fall short of a ban. The Post writes, Leading AI companies are planning to sign an accord committing to developing tech to identify, label, and control AI-generated images, videos, and audio recordings that aim to deceive voters ahead of crucial elections in multiple countries this year. The agreement, developed by Google, Microsoft, and Meta, as well as OpenAI, Adobe, and TikTok, however, does not ban deceptive political AI content. Basically, it's an agreement, it sounds like, to try to de-risk this sort of content without banning it entirely. This is, of course, in the spirit of the voluntary pledge that the White House got many AI companies to sign last July, where they, among other things, committed to try and identify and label fake AI content on their platforms. The question, of course, is whether this will be enough or whether there will be continued pressure to put even more stringent requirements on how AI shows up on the distribution channels. Interestingly, basically every part of the world right now is contributing to the AI conversation in some way. The EU continues to proceed with its AI Act, with lawmakers ratifying a recent political deal on the AI Act rules. And over in the UAE, OpenAI's Sam Altman has said that that country could be an AI regulatory testing ground. In a virtual appearance at the World Government Summit yesterday, Altman said, It's very hard to get all the regulatory ideas right in a vacuum. If there was a contained way that I could give people the future and let them experiment with it and then see what makes sense, what went wrong, what went right, that seems like an interesting experiment. I think for a bunch of reasons, the UAE would be set up to be a leader in the discussions about that. Now, the UAE, of course, is in a very interesting political spot relative to the geopolitics of AI. One company based in that area, G42, for example, has been at the epicenter of the battle between Washington and Beijing, and just yesterday told Bloomberg that the company is scaling back its presence in China in an effort to appease scrutiny from D.C., So whether it intentionally wants to be this sort of sandbox for AI regulation, or whether it just happens to become a geopolitical staging ground, it does seem like the Emirates are going to have an interesting role to play. Anyways, lots and lots of interesting things happening, as always, when it comes to AI society, elections, politics. It is something I am watching closely and will continue to do so. For now, however, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown. Until next time, peace.